Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. This is AA 100A, and this is Dr. Samah Abdel Jalil. We're doing a new chapter today, uh, a chapter on on poetry. And I'm hopeful that you will find the experience interesting because unlike the other uh, things that we have taken so far, uh, poetry uh, promises always to be very engaging and very interesting because it's a talent. Um, I mean, talent that goes both ways, talent as a producer of poetry, as a creator of poetry, and also as an appreciator of poetry. So being um, able to appreciate poetry is uh, a big deal because poetry does not uh, lend itself to easy interpretation. You'll have to think, um, I mean, you need to move from the literal to the inferential. You need to uh, read um, between the lines and everything. You need to also bring your own experiences to the poem. So the more knowledgeable you are, the, I mean, the solid your worldview is, the, the more uh, ideas that you can glean out of the poem, if you like. Um, OK, so this is the chapter that we have. So this is chapter two, reading poetry, the favorite book of peace. I just want to make sure that you guys can see the chapter. Can you see that? Uh, I need to check whether what I'm seeing is what you're seeing. Yes. Can see. Okay. Can, can you read it, young lady? Can you read whatever meets your eye right now? Hello? Yes, doctor. Yeah, can you can you read the, whatever meets your eye? <laughs> Um, reading poetry, the favor book of uh, beasts. Very good. And then we have the table of contents of the chapter. What the chapter is uh, going to cover, like you will like the introduction, tradition, and descent in poetry, right? So you're having that, and we have, of course, a pic or a picture in the middle, right? Okay, interesting. So uh, again, reading poetry. So it's poetry that we're doing. It's not philosophy like last time. Uh, it's not painting like the, the time before last time, right? It's not history than like <laughs> the time before the time before last time. OK, so poetry um, and the favorite book of beasts. So it's poetry that we're doing and it's beasts that, that we're doing. Let's first of all um, start with poetry. So when I say poetry, what comes to your mind? When I say poetry, what are the associations of poetry? What does the word poetry trigger at the back of your mind? Standard and uh, metaphors. OK. OK, what else? Anybody? And feelings? Rhythmatic words. Um, Metaphor. Uh, rhymed and rhymed words, rhythm. Metaphors. OK, interesting. Attitude, attitude or opinion. Uh, this would apply uh, if you're Mona. Th that would apply to all the other genres. You have you normally have attitudes and opinions uh, in, in novels and in, in, in pretty much everything that we uh, consume as as readers or listeners. So this is not exclusive to. We're talking about know. things that. that uh, oh yeah, I know. Uh, we're I, I see about, the words. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Type. So it's poetry that we're doing, and poetry is a genre in and of itself. We spoke enough about the word genre, right? When we said that. Um, short stories are a genre. When I say a novel is a genre, a play or drama is a genre, right? So these are different genres. And poetry is also a genre. So when I say a genre, it means that it has its rhetorical patterns that you cannot miss. If you're familiar with a specific or a particular genre, it's not easy to miss to miss it when you see one, okay? 
So when you read a novel, when you look at the cover page of a novel, for example, and you see it bulky uh, and it has an author, I mean, you can easily make, um, you know, uh, the conclusion that uh, this is a novel, perhaps. Uh, the same would apply to short stories. If you have, if you flip through a book and you, um, while flipping, you uh, recognize the fact that it's full of conversations and, and dialogues, you can make the conclusion that this is perhaps a play, not a novel. So um, you have generic patterns that can tell you um, exactly what uh, the genre is. Uh, the same would apply to poetry. Poetry has its own patterns, has its own characteristics that would uh, make you easily identify um, it when you see it, when you see poems. So let's let's talk about those characteristics, those elements that are exclusive uh, to poetry, things that you would see in a poem, but you wouldn't see in a novel or a short story or a play. So what is so exclusive and what is so peculiar about a poem? Whether, and by the way, I mean, uh, whether we're talking about Arabic or English or Urdu uh, poetry, it wouldn't make any difference because poetry is a universal genre. It applies here and everywhere. Please mute your mic. Okay, so we're talking about whatever makes poetry unique, whatever makes it different from the other genres. What do you think? It has a story of written. Um, we'll take Taima and then the young lady after. Okay, go ahead, yeah, Taima. Uh, yes, doctor. I was uh, said, uh, saying that uh, it has um, a specific uh, structure yeah, I mean, all of them, because it's a genre in and of its own right, it has it has to have a specific st structure. So can you share this specific structure with us, Yataima, that would make it different from the other genres? Uh, yes, um, it has uh, like uh, parts, uh, divided parts, and each uh, part has um, uh, one specific uh, rhyme or uh, ending. Yo, uh, so I, I wouldn't agree with you if, when you say that it is divided into parts because that would apply to novels, that would apply to essays. When you have an essay, you divide it and into I'm... parts. But I would agree, uh, I mean, yeah. when you spoke about this idea of rhyming, the fact that poetry yeah. is about yeah. rhyming, lines rhyme together at the end uh, of the line, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you, Daima. Uh, the other young lady, somebody was uh, trying to say something. Go ahead. Yes, I was uh, going to say similar thing that it was the way it's written that it's just in short lines. Yeah, the, the fact and not that complete lines. Sentences. So, w what do you mean by short lines? Can't we have short lines in short stories? Yes, it's not lines? like a, a complete sentence. You might have just one word per line. Okay. Sometimes. Okay, so it's but, I mean, the lines are not as long as uh, a story. Um, we see we see them in stories and novels and all uh, these kinds of things. So, are you trying to say that you don't we don't have this margin to margin lines that we see in novels and short stories, or in any other um, you know, genres, for that matter, in in other genres, you have uh, margin-to-margin lines. Uh, okay, lines. The uh, line start starts at the margin, and they end at the other margin horizontally. Don't we have that in other uh, genres? Right. Right or wrong? If if you have a book handy, look. Uh, yeah, I mean, look around in the room where you're sitting now and pick randomly any book that you have and open it, open any page, you're going, unless it's poetry, of course, you're going to find that the lines start 
يعني uh, it depends on whether this is Arabic or English. If it's English, the the line starts on the margin on the left and it moves all the way to the end of the uh, the margin uh, to the margin on the right. Don't we have that? The same applies to Arabic. If you have an Arabic book handy right now, uh, open it, any page randomly, and you're going to see that it starts from the right, the margin to the other margin horizontally. So this would apply to any uh, book that you may have. But with poetry, you don't have that. You don't have this margin to margin uh, style. The poem is normally in the middle, right? And it's not, the lines are not long. No, ha, ha, you know, no matter how long they are, you wouldn't compare them to uh, uh, the lines in a novel or a short story. Do you guys agree? Yes. Okay, that's yes. interesting. Okay, so this is yes. one unique element about poetry that would distinguish it from the other genres. So uh, Taima spoke about rhyme uh, and the fact that lines rhyme together. Uh, the young lady, I think it's Fatma. Uh, Fatma spoke about the fact that uh, a poem is normally in the middle and uh, it's not a margin to margin kind of thing, right? What else? What else about poetry that distinguish it from the other uh, genres? <clears throat> uh, grammatical rules might not apply to the poetry. Uh, that's interesting. The fact that we have what we call poetic license. You know what a license is? So po poetic license would be a permission you get as a poet. Permission to do what? To violate and go beyond the rules, whether those rules are rhetorical or grammatical. Okay, you would accept them in poems. You would accept uh, that the poet make errors and mistakes in order to serve uh, a purpose that he has in mind. But you wouldn't accept that in other genres. This is what we call poetic license. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. This is uh, what? This is whom? Fatma? Aya. Aya. Aya what? Aya Rabah. Uh, Aya, hi, hi. Hello. Uh, by the way, Aya, um, I, I had this long conversation with Mr. Amir, and I'll, uh, inshallah, perhaps after the class, I'll uh, share with you um, yani how we can yani, go around the problem that you're having, inshallah. Thank you so much, Doctor. Well, I appreciate okay. it. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, okay. Yes, Doctor? Yes, go ahead. Uh, it might uh, have a speaker. And sounds. Yeah. Right. Sounds. Yeah. Yeah. The um, sounds. Image. Um. Yeah. The um, this uh, uh, audio aspect is very important. That's why we normally encourage people and ask them to read poetry aloud. A part of the pleasure that you get from poetry uh, would be that you read it aloud and 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 feel the music, the internal music, when words come together, when you have what we call alliteration, which we, what we call saga uh, in Arabic, whether it's at the beginning or in the, perhaps at the end of the lines within uh, horizontally within the same, uh, the words within the same line. Yes, yes. Music is very important. That's why sounds are very important. Okay, interesting. Lots of very beautiful ideas that you guys are bringing to the conversation, and I thank you for them. Let's now move to you. So do we have poets in class? Do we have people who catch themselves uh, writing poetry sometimes? You don't have to be a published poet, uh, poet by the way. Yeah, I could remember I shared this long poem with you. I caught myself uh, writing poetry at 50, which is very uh, ironic. 
Um, so I'm sure you, you, uh, we have, we have talents in class. If only they would give us the opportunity to see yeah, what several, they... uh, several students shared their poems as well on WhatsApp. Yeah, ah, those... yes. Mm. Uh, can we have names? I mean, if you, if you, if you write poetry, just uh, come to the mic and say, I write poetry. Mm. So I'm, I'm the only poet in class. That's uh, <laughs> that's uh, no other poets. Unfortunately, it's a talent that's not available in all of us. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. I'm not saying that you I have to. to write, you know, I have written a couple of poems. No, no. But okay. Yeah, wait, 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 wait. Somebody said that she used to. Uh, um, go ahead. Yeah, I have written yes, a couple of poems. Name. <laughs> uh, in my own language. Uh, let's listen to what she has to say and then we'll come back to you. Okay, uh, go ahead. Raise your voice. What did yes, you say? My name is uh, Mona Muhammad Ali. Mona, yes. yes I used to write uh, s small poems when mm. I was younger. Okay. Like 14 lines, 15 lines. Yes. Mm. Okay, but you stopped here, Mona. Why, why, why did you stop? <laughs> Get busy with life, maybe. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, are you the one who has this 1000 uh, book library? Uh, excuse me? Yes. Um, no, uh, <laughs> you, you have, uh, you, uh, perhaps you're busy with the library. I mean, you have, uh, you told us that I'm you have a, a big um, study at home where you have hundreds of books, right? Yes. And the fact that you also uh, write other stuff, you, you wrote a number of novels, right? Uh, just poetry, maybe uh, small stories. Uh, and you said that you need a publisher, right? Am I correct? No, <laughs> maybe that's uh, another one. Yeah, perhaps we're talking about somebody else. Okay, Thanks. thank you, Mona. Thanks. Uh, okay, the other young lady. Yeah, the one who said that I used to, um, and she stopped. Yeah, I was saying that I uh, I was used to write poem, by, but in my own native Latin language. In your native language, which is what? Urdu? Oh, no, Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Uh, okay, what's your name? Sara. Sara, Sara what? Sara, only Sara. <laughs> only Sara. I mean, uh, okay, type yes, Sara. So you don't, you don't write in English? You don't write poetry in English, yes, Sara? No, not it. Okay. That's interesting. Um, but you stopped. You don't write poetry anymore, whether in your native language or in any other language, right? Well, uh, not now, but like uh, one year back, I was used mm. to in my school and college life. Uh huh. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you, Sara. Mm. Anybody else? Uh, we don't have uh, male poets in class. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, you don't write poetry if you're around. OK, so obviously he's not around. OK, so see, so it's um, poetry is um, a talent and it just um, appears uh, at any age. You don't have, yeah, you don't have to be um, born with it. It can come, by the way, and, uh, and this is from personal experience, it can come with reading. Um, you read a lot. Uh, at one point you find yourself, um, you know, wanting to um, express whatever feelings or thoughts you, that you have. So reading a lot can help you in that. Uh, anyway, so, um, so it's tra uh, tradition and descent in poetry. So we're talking about poetry. And what is it that we're going to talk about? We're going to talk about tradition and we're familiar with tradition and we're also familiar with descent. Tradition, uh, we agreed on the, the fact that you normally inherit um, a set of rules and practices and those rules and practices can be religious, can be societal and social, can be moral, 
okay and you live with them and they guide and regulate your life okay um somehow some people would um um you know come out and say listen with all due respect to tradition and everything we need to check those tradition uh, sets of tradition uh, from time to time and see whether they are valuable or not whether they are useful and practical enough or not uh, and we have seen that uh, with the uh, different uh, people that we have featured remember when we spoke about Christopher Marlow and his plays and we said that um, um, he, he was talking on uh, on a, on a very big uh, macrocosmic scale. He wanted to say we have inherited the fact that man should be humble, should humble uh, down and should, should not go beyond his limits. Uh, and these are uh, pieces of tradition that we have inherited. Um, he started to, uh, to say, why don't we challenge that? Why, I mean, with the discoveries that um, human beings uh, made with the, um, you know, the inventions and the scientific revolutions at the time, he said um, people and human beings can, can be limitless in terms of abilities if they are given the opportunity. So this was dissent. This was dissenting from the traditional view of man as uh, limited, as um, you know bound by rules and regulations whether they are religious or otherwise so this was dissent uh, and this was the dissent in um, even in his uh, drama he tried to give expression to those uh, ideas um, especially in dr faustus and we have done that already and then we went to Cezanne, the painter and we have seen uh, how much of a dissenter he was, the fact that he was a dissenting uh, individual. He wouldn't uh, um, settle for whatever uh, artistic tradition uh, he had. Remember um, this struggle between traditionalists and moderns during uh, Cezanne's time. Actually, Cezanne is the, is the one who inaugurated, inaugurated and started uh, this trend of um, going again against tradition. Remember the rules and the regulations of the salon at the time, and the fact that every time he uh, applies for a, pl a place in the salon for his uh, paintings to be displayed, they would say, no, you're not following our guidelines, our classical and our traditional guidelines. And he insisted uh, in, um, you know, using his own, um, yeah, I mean, his own style. He started uh, a style of his own and he insisted on, on pursuing it until they themselves decided to, uh, to accept him and to accept lots of people uh, uh, like him. So this was descent in, in, in painting and in art. And then we uh, went all the way to uh, Plato and uh, we spoke about Plato and we said that Plato uh, is a typical philosopher who uses his mind and um, he would also have uh, issues with uh, traditions and traditional beliefs, traditional moral beliefs. And he was, he and Socrates, his uh, create, uh, I mean creation, were against traditional moral beliefs and they would only accept those that would pass uh, the test of, of uh, the mind. We have spoken enough about that. This time around, we're, we also have tradition and we also have descent uh, from, uh, from tradition. So the tradition that we have here is uh, poetic tradition, traditions or tradition of poetry. Poetry has been there since time immemorial and it has its own tradition okay and people 
or poets would follow uh, those sets of tradition down through the ages. We will also have dissenting voices. Uh, we will have poets who would come and say, uh, listen, we've been following um, traditional uh, poetic uh, practices and forms for so uh, long, and we, uh, why don't we chart our own way? Why don't we find our own voices and everything? So uh, tradition here uh, and is uh, in this chapter um, is uh, poetic uh, tradition and dissenting here would not uh, be dissenting from moral tradition, for example, or moral beliefs it would be dissenting from um, the tradition of poetry, as we, we will see. Uh, in order to talk about that, we're going to have a number of poets and a number of poems. Uh, uh, and these poems and those uh, poets um, are all collected or are all uh, put in uh, an anthology of poetry that we uh, uh, call the favorite book of beasts. OK, so we will have an anthology and I, perhaps I need to define what an anthology is. So what, what do you think? What is an, an anthology, Agama? I'm asking you. Uh, excuse me, just give me a second. Yeah, a collection of what? Go on. Yes, yes. Yeah, Dr. Ahmed, go ahead. Yeah, a collection, of, a collection um, of poetry, stories, novels, yeah, in general. Novels would be, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't include novels in uh, an anthology because of the yes. novels are very bulky and very long in terms of size, right? You would include poems because poems, uh, no matter how long, uh, or, you know, some of them may be, they are still containable, if you like. So anthologies are normally, um, or, or they, they, they normally contain poetry or poems. They would contain short stories sometimes that you, they would contain uh, plays. Because uh, like I said, um, no matter how long, uh, these pieces of uh, uh, art are, they are uh, short if you compare them to novels. So this is what an anthology is. It's, uh, it's a book that um, would have poems by different uh, poets. Um, so you don't have an author. For an anthology, you don't have an author, and this is for obvious reasons, because you have so many poets, so ma many poems by so many poets. So you, you normally have uh, what we call an editor. An editor is somebody who would collect those poems and they, he, would, he or she would put them in the anthology. Okay, the, so the anthology that we have here is called the Faber Book of Beasts. The Faber, Faber is a publisher or a, a publishing house. Okay. Uh, okay. So, and we're saying that it's an anthology, and the title of the anthology is the Faber Book of Beasts. So, uh, give me a synonym for the word beasts. You know what a beast is. Animals. 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 Excellent, animals. So we're talking about animals. So the anthology that we have has only animal poetry. So poetry on and about animals. Okay. Um, okay. So let's talk about the choice of the poems because this is obviously very controversial. It's something that not two people would agree on because of our different 
tastes. Um, okay, I can come tomorrow and say, listen, uh, uh, I am making an anthology of poems, uh, um, uh, poets, um, perhaps I'm, I'm collecting poems from uh, poets over the, uh, let's say, the past 50 years. And you would give me suggestions and recommendations and somebody else would give me suggestions and recommendations. Can I cater or can I accommodate all your suggestions and recommendations? If I have 10 people or I have 15 people and they are all recommending poems to include in the anthology, is it possible that I would uh, take all the recommendations into consideration? Can I do that? Maybe. What do you think? Yeah, but yeah, I, I can do that. But uh, w what do you think that would take us? So uh, if you give me five and the other five and the other five, I'll end up having 200, perhaps 300 poems, right? Yes. And perhaps more. Um, I, I cannot, and, and, and I also have my own taste. And I am the editor. So, so it would be it would be very difficult for me to uh, make you all happy by accepting all your recommendations. I have to anger and upset you because I may say, listen, uh, Taima gave me uh, five poems and I'm going to only choose one of them. Uh, Fatma gave me five poems and I'm not going to choose any of them because um, I, I mean, I don't like them. I, I don't, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Ahmed is going to give me five poems, but I'll, I'll only get, take one of them. So eventually you're not going to agree with me 100% because you have your own tastes. Uh, Taima would give me uh, five poems by um uh, a woman poet or five women women uh, women poets and i don't choose any of them time out would come say yeah this guy is sexist he only believes in men right um uh, fatma would give me uh, five poems by uh, five non arab poets and I wouldn't choose any of them. Yeah, this guy is, uh, because he is Arab, he, uh, he wouldn't include uh, poems by uh, non-Arabs. You see, you see how uh, disagreeing we're going to be. You see how daunting and how challenging the, the job of an anthologist is. He or she has to put this all into consideration while collecting his anthology, and at the end of the day, uh, he is going to leave lots of people unhappy because he wouldn't be able to cater for the needs and the tastes of everyone. This is the challenge that we have with anthologies, and this is the challenge that uh, Meldon, the anthologist, or the one who uh, collected uh, this anthology, uh, um, uh, the challenges that he met and that, that he will talk about. But let's agree on something. When it comes to anthology, anthologies and um, uh, collecting anthologies, um, at one point you will find that the editor or the anthologist behaving in dictatorial ways. Dictatorial in the sense that you um, you give him your choices and he wouldn't choose any, he wouldn't take any of you, uh, of your uh, preferences and recommendations. So anthologists, uh, anthologists normally have those despotic or dictatorial tendencies where sometimes they accept your opinion and your um, recommendation sometimes they say no I have my own philosophy uh, I know uh, what I am doing I don't want uh, any uh, recommendations 
Um, and this is what we are going to see with Meldon. Meldon is going to talk about that, and he's going to also give us his philosophy, why he has chosen those uh, people that he, he had chosen, and also why he is arranging his poetry uh, or his poems in, in the way he is arranging. Uh, and whether uh, it has significance behind it or it's just random. Anyway, let's agree on the fact that we are in for an anthology of poems, and those poems are animal uh, poems because it's all about animals. Okay, so why? Why would, uh, I mean, what what is normally the trend if you have read any animal poetry, whether in your native language or in English. What, what do we normally have in animal poetry? What do we normally uh, have, uh, I mean, in terms of patterns that are recurring, that, that, gets re that get repeated? Uh, um, yeah. They, uh, yeah, yeah. They describe animals uh, behaving as people. Yeah, okay, that's, um, this is what we call anthropo uh, anthropomorphic. Uh, anthropomorphic means uh, animal poetry is for the most part anthropomorphic, which means that you give animals human attributes. And one of the human attributes and features that you give to animals is uh, you give them the ability to speak, the ability to think, to ability, the ability to also behave like animals, being greedy, being uh, sometimes angry for no obvious reasons, mean. <laughs> so of course, the, there are other uh, good qualities, but we don't see them uh, as often <laughs> in animal poetry. The focus is normally on those, you know, bad uh, distinguishing qualities. Yeah, thank you, Fatma. So uh, for the most part, you have this element of anthropomorphology. <laughs> uh, it's, it's such a long word, but sometimes it's always like this. I keep, um, you know, uh, stumbling, uh, pronouncing it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, go ahead. My name is Simo. I think I think they uh, they aim to give the people uh, moral lessons by telling uh, by telling stories about animals yeah that's interesting the this moral element aspect is always there in animal poetry um, you get you are sure to come out of the poem or the animal poem with a moral lesson okay that's interesting okay so this element of anthropomorphism that we agreed on and also the idea that there is always uh, moral uh, lessons. Uh, let's reflect and see if we can go back to our native languages and see whether we have animal poetry. Do we have animal poetry? Let's let's um, let's talk about uh, Arabic literature. Do we have animal poetry, Agama? I think we don't have. Yeah. Maybe they, this style, yeah. Yeah. not Kalila, as a... Kalila and Demna is uh, an excellent example of animal poetry. Kalila and Demna uh, is, uh, I think it was, I mean, it has been taken from uh, perhaps Indian. Uh, Kalila and Demna is by uh, Ibn al-Muqaffa, right? And Ibn al-Muqaffa used to live during the Abbasid um, dynasty, I think, al um, Or, yeah, I think al or perhaps the, the, the final days of the Umayyad uh, Caliphate. Anyway, so Kalila and Demna is animal poetry, and it's uh, beautiful animal poetry, if you ask, where you normally have animals um, acting and behaving like human beings, tricking each other, and you are sure to find a moral lesson at the end 
of the poem. Uh, let, let me ask you, and I, I'm not sure that this was poetry. This was not poetry, right? It was. It was a novel, I think. Short uh, story. No, 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 these were short stories. Uh, what would connect them to animal poetry would be the idea of anthropomorphism, the fact that we have animals behaving like human beings and given human attribute. It was written in prose, actually. Okay. So this was. Yeah. OK, um, uh, we have people from uh, perhaps India and uh, Bangladesh um, and also Pakistan. And I think, um, I mean, what combines them would be that most of them speak Urdu. Do we have something in Urdu that is also animal poetry, Agama? Uh, per, mm, perhaps not that you know of, right? Okay, so, uh, do we have other cultures that, uh, do we have people from other cultures that would like to tell us about their animal poetry experience, if any? Excuse me? Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Dr. Ahmed. From my little experience in Arabic literature, I, I think uh, Arabic literature or, or poetry, uh, uh, yeah, any lakes of of, uh, of poems relating to to animals or, or to the beast. We mm -hmm. have anthology. We have anthology. Our literature uh, rich in uh, anthology because uh, we have a lot of books, uh, not written but collected or edited yeah. by 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 uh, anthologists. Anthologist, uh, for example, Al mm Mufadaliyat, -hmm. Al Mufadaliyat, the best, the best, which was, which was collected uh, by Al Mufadal Zabi and Al Asmaiyat, Al Asmaiyat by Al Asmai, yes. and uh, we have a lot. But uh, uh, relating to to the speaking or talking between animals and and people, how animals can 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 teach people how to behave as human better than the animals. We couldn't find it in, in our Arabic culture, but we could we could find it in Quran, a lot of stories. Excellent, yes, that's yeah, true. Yeah, yes. yeah the, the, the crow, the crow, uh, which was, uh, or, or, uh, it, it uh, taught the uh, uh, son of Adam how he buries his brother, who, 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 who يعني, uh, whom was killed by him. يعني. Yes. He, he didn't know how to, how to how to handle this case after after he did his crime against his brother. But Allah uh, said, a crow to yeah. to help him, يعني, يعني, to imitate imitate how he does, يعني. and and there's a small ant uh, in and the and valley. And also uh, the stories that would uh, I mean uh, still in Quran uh, the stories that would link uh, Solomon, Sayyidina Sulaiman. Exactly, uh, yeah. the hoodhood and uh, I, I think the fact that he picked up the language and uh, they used to speak to him this is featured in Quran and there is also um, I don't know whether you're familiar with a philosopher and uh, a Muslim philosopher by the name of Al-Farabi uh, was it Al-Farabi who, who wrote Hayy ibn Yaghzan yeah Ah, yeah, this is a very philosophical, it's a, it's a philosophical uh, tale where, you, I mean, the whole thing is a metaphor uh, and it's a metaphor about knowledge and how human beings, uh, uh, you know, come to know things. It's, it's a very beautiful uh, piece of work philosophically and also on the level of literature and I would recommend that you um, go and read it. It's very, very interesting where you have um, you know uh, somehow you have a jungle and you have um, you know a small baby who was obviously uh, born in the jungle and then he was perhaps brought up by animals and um, it's like uh, more or less like um, Tarazan uh, it's it's very similar, but, but of course the uh, the Muslim version is way way older than the the Hollywood uh, version. 
so we do have we do have this element of anthropomorphism in 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 Arabic and in Muslim literature. Yes, that's interesting. So this is what we'll will be uh, talking about. Uh, it's the idea of having. Uh, animals speak and behave like human beings. Okay, so um, uh, we, we, we'll talk about um, tradition in poetry in general, and we'll talk about uh, dissenting uh, from those sets of tradition, how some poets uh, would challenge those traditions and they would chart their, their own ways. So we'll have uh, William Blake and we will have uh, The Fly, one of his poems. Uh, we will have John Donne and uh, The Flea, one of his poems. And we'll have Miroslav Holub, uh, The Fly, another The Fly. Um, and uh, uh, if you look at them, you can almost tell that William Blake and John Donne are uh, Anglo-Saxon poets. They belong to the Anglo-Saxon culture and literature. And by Anglo-Saxon, of course, I mean English uh, and British literature. But you, you, you can also um, you make the conclusion that Mirosolov Holub is not English, right? So Mirosolov, is it English? I mean, the name, does it sound English? Mirosolov Holub? Hmm? Maybe it's Russian. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So he is not English, whether he is Russian or any other uh, nationality. Um, we're trying to establish the fact that he's not Anglo-Saxon. OK, so uh, the reason why we're making this distinction, because we are going to talk about, um, you know, English uh, poetry tradition and also non-English uh, poetry tradition and see whether those guys are deviating from their established uh, poetic traditions or not. Uh, okay, and then uh, we will go to the Faber Book of Beasts and we'll, we'll see how Meldon, the anthologist, is talking about his anthology and he uh, the excuses that he is making and the ju justifications that he is giving for his uh, choices. And we're going to end with uh, D.H. Lawrence, and D.H. Lawrence is a very famous uh, poet and novelist. And uh, uh, we're going to focus on the idea of his descent, the fact that he is a poetic descent. He, he writes poetry. Uh, it is true that he, uh, he got inspired by traditional poets, but he had his own voice, and he, he was deliberate about using his own voice and not uh, pursuing and following other people. OK. Um, so this is all material for something bigger. And for something more functional, which is the idea of introducing you to poetry as a different uh, generic experience. And of course, um, you know, teaching you how to read poetry and how to understand poetry. So uh, whatever is coming is mere material that would help you experiment with poetry uh, on the level of understanding and on, on the level of analyzing and analysis. So critical reading. So this is what you're going to do. You're going to read poems critically, critically. When we say critically, uh, of course, we mean um, you know, um, breaking the poem down to its basic components. Uh, I'm just trying to. Uh, OK. So breaking a poem down to its basic components, uh, looking at it horizontally and vertically, coming up with ideas. Uh, connecting the style to the uh, message or the messages that the writer is trying to get across. Um, and we'll talk also about tradition, uh, poetic traditions, and we'll talk about um, some of the poets who deviated or who went beyond those traditions and resisted them. 
<clears throat> okay, so as we agreed, um, the anthology that we're using uh, for the poetry that uh, we are analyzing is the, uh, the favorite book of beasts by Paul Meldon. Uh, he is the editor and he will, uh, in one of the series that uh, we have, he will uh, uh, be giving us reasons uh, as why he has chosen uh, those poems over others and, and, uh, and the chronology, uh, chronology, whether he is adopting a chronological order, starting with the past and then moving to the, uh, um, the present, or is he using uh, an alphabetical arrangement. Um, uh, we'll have, like I said, uh, poets by certain uh, poems by certain poets, and those po poets uh, are also, um, you know, somehow maverick. They, they um, would go beyond uh, the established poetic traditions. Uh, one thing uh, we need to stress uh, um, about poetry, um, which is the idea that uh, poetry does not lend itself to easy interpretation. You'll have to read a poem more than once. So with poetry, the more you read, the more you will understand. <clears throat> Again, uh, tradition and traditional, uh, we spoke enough about uh, tradition the different types of tradition and this time around of course the focus is on poetic uh, pra uh, traditional practices so uh, the chapter focuses on poetry uh, where we will also talk about tradition and descent uh, we need to also stress the fact that unlike other um, discourses where um, tradition, uh, I mean, dissenting would be, um, um, you know, perhaps legitimate and everything. With poetry, um, even the dissenter has to, to start with traditions. You cannot dissent from the traditions of poetry from day one. If you're a poet, if you're a promising or a budding poet, somebody who has started uh, a few years earlier or a few, perhaps a few days, you have to uh, first of all train yourself in the poetic uh, traditions. You need to write uh, and use the forms that traditional poets are using until you have, um, you know, enhanced your skills and until you have developed your skills, and then you will be able to, to start something new. So uh, unlike the other discourses with poetry, you have to start as a traditionalist. And then um, down through, uh, I mean, along the way, you start to uh, use your own voice, you start to uh, write um, uh, things that are um, not necessarily uh, consistent with tradition. So you start as an imitator and then over time you change and you have your own voice. So what happens if you are so set in the old ways? I mean, if you are tradition, a traditionalist from day one until you retire from poetry, or you die. Is that acceptable? No, people will get tired. So you need to kind of provide them with something new. So you start off as a traditionalist, following the rules and regulations of the existing body of poetry, traditional body of poetry that you have. But somehow down the road, you have to uh, um, perhaps experiment with the form, the traditional form, and come up with something new, so experiment with the ideas. So you cannot uh, remain uh, a, tr a traditionalist all the way. No, uh, in this case, you wouldn't be read over, over the years. People are going to lose interest in you. Okay, so when people 
um, you know, write poetry. They and when when they imitate uh, other poets, they imitate what there is uh, always uh, this idea of styles. You you imitate styles and also you sometimes imitate uh, ideas and significant ideas. These are the two aspects that uh, people uh, or poets focus on. We, we talk about styles of writing, when we talk about rhyme schemes and verse forms, and we also talk about ideas. Okay, so at the beginning, you're following the same style. Uh, at the beginning, you are also introducing and recycling ideas that everyone is talking about. But should you stay there for the rest of your life? You, know, you are, um, you know, doing yourself a big disservice. People are not going to accept you. At one point, you would need to tweak your style and start, uh, I mean, the traditional style and start something new. Uh, at one point, you would have to uh, either uh, challenge the ideas that have always been there or uh, perhaps talk about ideas that nobody spoke about. Um, <clears throat> so again, the idea of repeating and recycling traditional uh, uh, formulas for the rest of your life uh, is not correct. Your poetry as a poet should be uh, a conversation between the old and the new so that you can stimulate interest and uh, and also keep the form alive. Um, uh, whenever we talk about the idea of tradition and how much you would be a traditionalist and how much you, you would be, um, you know, modern and uh, non-traditional, we, we, we always uh, think of uh, Louis McNee or McNeese. Louis McNee is an Irish poet and he has uh, some something to say about this tension between the old and the new. He says that a, a poem to be recognizable must be traditional, but to be worth recognizing it must be something new. So as you can see, he is combining the old and the new. So people start off traditionalists. So when you, as a poet, when you start, you are traditionalist in uh, you use the forms that that everybody else is using. So you don't start having your own form. If, if everybody is using the sonnet in order to express the, their ideas, you should use the sonnet. OK, so you're going to use a traditional form, which is the sonnet. OK, and this is going to be recognizable enough. People are going to recognize you because you are using something that they are familiar with and that they know. Okay, however, you need uh, you know, for them to go beyond recognition and admire and appreciate you, you have to introduce something new. So you can be using an old form like the sonnet, but the ideas that, that you are presenting are perhaps fresh and new, and you're dealing, even uh, you're dealing with old, ideas, but in uh, in a fresh way. So as you can see, tradition is ingrained in poetry. It's, it's there, yet that poetry cannot survive any more than music or philosophy can through traditional forms and motifs alone. You cannot stay traditional till the end of your life. No. OK, and then, of course, you know that poetry is um, I wouldn't say difficult, but it's not. It doesn't. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, it would need you to uh, walk the extra mile, like they say. Uh, if people re read uh, prose once, you would have to read um, uh, a line of poetry or or a stanza more than once. If people read silently, you would have to read the poem uh, out loud because of, um, you know, the, the limitations that poetry may impose on people. It, it needs uh, work, and, and that's why they say, sometimes they say it's, uh, it's the most intellectual, because you have to 
uh, put things together and come up with the big, the big picture. Anyway, so like I said, we're going to start with three poems about insects. The Fly by William Blake, The Flea by John Donne, and The Flea by Merslow Hollow. Uh, okay, so if we're going to follow chronology, chronology means that you start with the old and then you go to the new. You start with the whatever is old and then you end up with, uh, with, with the past and you end up with the present. So is this arrangement correct, Emma? Look, we're going to start uh, by w William Blake's poem, The Fly. We're going to start with it, The Fly by William Blake. Look at the dates. And then after that, we will have The Flea by John Donne. And then uh, we will end with The Fly by uh, Merslov Hollow. Is this arrangement chronological? Are we, uh, if, if we're going to follow this organization or this arrangement, is it chronological? Are we starting from uh, whatever is past and then we move to whatever no. is present? No. Okay, so if, if we're using chronology, we're moving from past to present, how are you go going to arrange them? So what is going to be number one? John Don. John Don. Yeah, you, we should start with John Don's poem. The flea, okay? Then? The fly by William Blake. Then, yeah, excellent. The fly by William Blake. And then we end up with Merslow Hollops, the fly, another fly, right? Okay, so um, the, um, the organization here is not chronological. So what is the tra traditional organization of poems anyway? So the traditional organization of poems or the traditional arrangement is normally chronological. But we don't have that, right? Do we have that? No. You said we don't, no. right? Which is what? Which is dissenting? So even the anthologist, okay, is dissenting, is challenging the established order of poems, right? So we have dissent even without reading the poems. Okay, so if, if Meldon, the anthologist or the editor is not using chronological order, what is he using? Uh, when asked, he said, yeah, yeah, he said, uh, yeah, when asked, he said that I'm using the alphabetical order. Why? Why would you do that? He said, because if I start with uh, whatever is in the past and then I move to the present, you would, as a reader, think that I am preferring the past because I'm starting with the past. You would b believe that I think that past is better, better than the present and the future. Okay? Said, no, I am not preferring. That's why I'm using this uh, chronologic, um, I'm using this alphabetical order. You know, it reminds me of something, and I'm sure you have noticed that. Sometimes you have, in, in a movie, you, sometimes you have more than one movie star. You perhaps have three or four, and all of them are all over the place. All of them are celebrities, and all of them are very important. So, we have a problem. The director would have a problem. Uh, should he start with uh, this guy's name and then the second one and then the third one? So obviously, if I choose one of them and they are all, the three or four of them are co-equal or are they are all equal in, in fame and in popularity, if I choose Samah and then after Samah, Ahmed, Right? Ahmad is going to be angry. Right? So what do they do? They normally say, oh, we're, we're, uh, we're use um, alphabetical order. And we're going to say that we're using alphabetical order. So appearance in 
alphabetical order would avoid you the embarrassment that otherwise uh, you would have. So it's the same thing here. Melden is saying I'm, I'm using the alphabetical arrangement because I don't want to start with the old and then you feel that I prefer old poems uh, to new ones. Are you getting the idea? Yes. OK. So uh, the poem that we're starting with is by William Blake. And it's the fly and I would like you to read the poem. Can you see it? Can you see the, uh, the poem on the left? Yes, yes, of course. Okay. Right. Let me let me tell you something. Uh, and this is very important. Whenever you have a poem, um, a poem is what we call a primary source. I mean, whenever we talk about research, we talk about primary sources and secondary sources. OK, so when when I ask you to write about uh, uh, about a poem and say, for example, uh, I need you to uh, um, to write an essay on anthrop uh, anthropomorph um, uh, anthropomorphism in the fly. OK, in the fly by William Blake. OK, so the first thing would be for you to read the poem. The poem would be the primary source. And then, of course, you're going to find that so many people wrote essays and articles on the same poem. So you don't go and read second resources and leave the primary source. So, so what do I mean by uh, primary and second source? And from their titles, from their names. Primary means first, the first source. And second source means the second source, right? So had it not been for the primary source, you wouldn't have the second source. Yes. OK, so mm -hmm. people when people do research. They don't go to the second source. And then they go to the first source, uh, the primary source. You start with the primary source, you read it, understand it, and then you go to the second source. Never start with the second source about something. Why? Because you, you, you're not giving yourself, you're denying yourself the pleasure of coming up with your own ideas. If you read the second resource, which is an essay or an article or a book about the poem, you will find yourself repeating what other people are saying about the poem. So you are um, kind of what? Forgoing the pleasure of coming up with your own ideas uh, and appreciating the poem uh, firsthand. OK, type. Again, a part of the second resource thing that uh, I keep talking about would be the biography of the author or the poet. Sometimes people, uh, they know that uh, they have a poem uh, by William Blake and they go to Wikipedia, for example, and read about William Blake. No, this is not correct. You still need to read the poem OK, and you come up with your own ideas about the poem. And then after that, you go to the second resource, which, which can be critical material on the poem. Uh, it could be, uh, in, um, you know, the biography of the poet uh, and so on. Right. So our approach and the recommended uh, approach and the, the approach of choice would be that uh, people um, um, read the poem first, come up with as many ideas as they possibly can, and then they go to the second resources. Okay. So how do we read a poem? Uh, whenever you have a poem, you have two things. You have 
the form of the poem and you have the content of the poem. The form is how the poem is made. The form would be the style, would be the rhyme and the rhythm, would be the internal music, would be the imagery, right? How long the, po the lines are, how short they are, whether this shortness means something, whether this longness means something, right? So you start with the form or the formal aspects. Form here means shakliya, yeah. the formal aspects. And then after you're done with that, you go to the thematic aspects. Thematic, you focus on the messages and the ideas and the themes that the writer is trying to communicate to us. You don't start with the theme or the ideas. OK. So a, a good reading of a poem would be by reading, of course, I mean uh, studying a poem. A good reading of a poem would be uh, uh, for you to be able to connect the form to the theme. To, to You try to establish how the style would help the, the, the poet or the writer communicate his ideas. OK, so you start with the form and then you move to the theme or the ideas. This is called the formal approach uh, to uh, poetry analysis. OK, fine. So let's read it. Uh, I would like you to read the poem. And then uh, I'll give you uh, perhaps uh, three minutes or four minutes. Remember, it can be short, but it can be so filled with original ideas. OK, um, do we have, you know, best practices as how we can read a poem? Yes, we have. So you read a, po a poem more than once. You don't just read it once and it's not uh, this casual reading that we associate with uh, newspapers and and magazines and fashion magazines and stuff. No. You need to read the poem more than once. You also need to read it uh, out loud. Why would you read it out loud? Because reading it out loud would uh, slow you down. You don't just read la, 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 la. It's not about making noise. Uh, and full stop. Reading out loud would make you conscious of the sounds of the poem because the sound is as important as everything else in the poem, right? So let's read it. And um, uh, before before we read it, let's agree on on a number uh, of things. So the the poem is. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether you can see that or not. We have gaps between and among the lines. Right? Every four you, you have every four lines and then you have a gap. Right? And then you have yeah. other yeah. So what do we call those four lines? Stanzas. Yeah, these are stanzas. Okay? They call them rooms. <laughs> as if you have uh, you know, it's and I'm hopeful that you would appreciate this analogy. It's as if you have a block of flats, Amara. You're familiar with Amara, right? It's, you have a block of flats where you have how many floors do you have? In this block of flats, how many floors can you see? Mm. One, four. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five. We have four, four. floors, right? So yes. every and each floor is called a stanza. In poetry, you call it a stanza. So you have five stanzas. Okay. Good. Doctor. Doctor. Yes. Um, do we call this a kind of uh, bo uh, poetry? Is um 
vanilla or something like that style? Mm, no, not that I'm aware of. No, we're, 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 it's as simple as defining what a stanza is. We're, we're, we're still talking about stanzas and the fact that we have five stanzas. Okay? Doctor? Okay. Doctor? Now. Yes. You mean, you mean uh, each poetry we have uh, five stanza? No, not. not. Uh, I'm saying that if you have a number of lines getting together and then you have a gap, and then another uh, four or five or perhaps more or less uh, lines getting together. This, these, these are called stanzas. It's like the idea of paragraphs in an essay where you have a paragraph and then a gap and then another paragraph and, and then a third. OK. OK, doctor. So how many stanzas do we have? Five. OK, so now what? So we're going to read the five stanzas. We're going to read the poem. And uh, I would like you to mute your mics and read them out loud and read them more than once, twice. So you're going to read the poem more than once and you're going to read them out loud. OK, and I'll give you four minutes for that. OK, everyone. OK, doctor. Okay. Yalla, OK, OK, doctor. Yalla, go ahead. Excuse <clears throat> <coughs> Thank you. 
Let me know when you have finished. Huh? I'm done. I finished. Okay, good. Me too. Okay. Somebody is raising her hand, Shamsa. Is it raised by default, Shamsa? Well, you want you want to say something? Mm, she, I think she left or something. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Can you talk about it? Yes. Okay. So let's. Uh, I mean, give me your overall impressions. Uh, whatever you have felt about or feel about the poem, uh, that would include uh, whether you think it's uh, easy or difficult, whether the ideas uh, come easily, whether you have to, I mean, your experience with the poem, good or bad. Yalla. Uh, and by the way, with poetry, you don't have one single interpretation. You don't have one single insight or answer. Poetry is up for grabs, if you like, where uh, everyone can understand it the way he or she sees fit. OK. Uh, but of course, you have to provide justifications as why you think it should go this way or that way. OK. Yalla. Bismillah. Can I start? Yeah, go ahead. What's your name? Uh, Fatima. Fatima? Okay. Yes. I actually read it quite a few times, and each time I got something different. Okay. So Which the first is bad. What do you think? Me, do, you, do you think that, that this is irritating you, troubling you, or do you no, think it's okay? No. Oh. It's intriguing. Okay. Hmm. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, this is part of the beauty of poetry. The fact that you, every time you read it, you come up with new ideas. Um, okay, so uh, Fatma, so whatever you have understood, you said that you read it um, a number of times. Yes, so the first time for me, it was just, it, to me, it's just about someone complaining about a fly that's annoying mm -hmm. and then the second time around it was com when he compared himself as um to the man was a person going through life and not really dealing with reality and then okay. the last time i read it honestly towards the end it seemed like a suicidal thought um in in what sense who is um, the um, the fourth stanza? Mm -hmm. And the last stanza as well. It seemed like either the fly or the man did not wish to live, or how he would see be happy, alive or dead. You mean uh, this is a, a moment of desperation, or this is a moment where he comes to the realization that we we will die? anyway and somehow and we should embrace death what do you think i think it was maybe someone trying to find peace and whether death will bring that or not mm -hmm. so it's not a moment of desperation he's not desperate i don't i don't think it's desperate but the thought is still there okay that's interesting thank you fatma can we have somebody else? Yes, doctor. Okay, hey, Matt, go ahead. Um, I think uh, the poet here uh, is trying to tell us that uh, death is something um, we can't escape from, and it's mm -hmm. supposed to be something good at the mm -hmm. end. Okay, so uh, this is, um, this is the bottom line, but in order to reach this conclusion, uh, he said things, right? Yes, he, he was. Yes, he was thinking about life and how he thinks life should be, 
uh, but at the end of uh, the life, it was we all of us were supposed to die. That's so it. So what's the link? I mean, he's obviously trying to establish a link between animals and human beings. Did you miss that? So why? I yes, think he's... Have, yeah, ah, yes. Oh, go, go on. No, no uh, doctor, continue. Uh, I'm saying, uh, yeah, yeah, I would like you to print to the conversation this animal element to it. So what's, uh, wh what is so in common between this little fly and the human being? Yes, doctor, can I comment? Yes. Um, so it seems here like he was sitting in a, in a summer's uh, day and a fly uh, just comes in and she is flying and it, uh, without even thinking he just brushes it away mm. and apparently he kills it and he compares himself to the fly and no yeah. people in general just go through life working, playing, singing without even thinking about death and suddenly well, yeah, and with no with no no uh, plan or any notice, uh, mm -hmm. death can uh, face you yes. directly. So, so uh, you have two um, two hands, and those two hands are referred to as thoughtless. Thoughtless means blind. Mm. Okay, and you have the hand of the human being who would kill an animal as as um, you know it, it's it's as simple as uh, you know moving his hand right yes. Uh, yes okay and you also have another blind hand okay and in this case you would have the blind hand of fate right exactly the fact that uh, um, and it's it's as simple as you. I mean, you toil and you work hard and you have ambitions and everything, and that would all come down to death eventually, right? But this is the comparison that he's trying to establish between animals, especially small, very tiny animals like the fly. And there is also, I mean, the the choice of. Yeah, obviously, whether you have a fly, uh, I mean, why didn't he talk, for example, about uh, a bird? Uh, why didn't he talk about something even bigger than a bird? So what is the significance of the choice? The choice of a fly, you know what a fly is, right? A fly and a person doesn't even think about it. And whenever a fly lies on your nose, you just brush it away without even yes. thinking. Very, you know? very yeah. tiny. Yeah, exactly. Also, and also, it, it, it's very fragile, right? It takes, I mean, sometimes, <laughs> you know, some people are like this. I mean, you can, I mean, you have a fly here and it's, or you can have, a, I, I don't know whether this is, that, that would be, a mosquito or something, and all they do is like like this, right? Yeah, this is what it takes to kill yes, a, yes. an insect. You just can you see me? Yes, doctor. Uh, it's uh, it's here, okay. And that all you need to do to kill the insect or whatever they call it is, and that would be it. See? Yes. So. So the fly here is very insignificant. Okay, so if you compare the fly to my hand, of course, the fly is very insignificant because my hand is very huge, gigantic. It's the same relationship between destiny and human beings. Destiny is gigantic. It's an element of nature. And you as a human being, you're a very small, tiny insignificant fly right go to any mountains okay and of course you are at the bottom of the mountain and then you have the mountain and measure measure yourself against the mountain how would you look from a distance would we see you or the mountain invisible ah yes See, 
So this is what uh, William Blake is trying to say. He's trying to say that human beings are insignificant. They are as, insignif as uh, insignificant uh, as uh, flies and the other uh, small creatures. Okay, what would what would uh, take you to 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 kill a fly? It would take you uh, a hand. What would take uh, um, you know uh, you know destiny to kill a human being? It's um, uh, so the comparison is very. Um, I mean, when you come to think about it, it's very, very difficult, right? Um, okay. So in order to do that, uh, we have a process. He is trying to kind of prepare us to this moment where you can get uh, this idea that human beings are exactly like small uh, creatures and they are as insignificant. Um, so he starts off with the fly, right? And then he maneuvers in the second uh, stanza and he says that I am you and you are like me in order to move to the third stanza and talk about human beings and how they can be uh, also crushed away, right? And then in the fourth stanza, he talks about death and the fact that strength and breath and, and these are all part of death, not life. And uh, whether and then he comes to the conclusion, uh, which is obviously uh, you can consider it um, a change of heart. Um, you would think in the first stanzas that he is not happy about the comparison, that he is pointing to the fragility of human beings and to the vanity of human wishes, the fact that no matter uh, how hard you try and um, um, however hard you do this and that, at the end it will come down to the idea that fate will crush you away and you are no more. So you have a change of heart towards the end of the poem where he embraces death. He say, then am I a happy fly if I live or if I die? It also points to the fact that flies um, and the other creatures are don't or we, 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 we think that they don't think about their death. They don't come to us and uh, they communicate feelings of uh, uh, perhaps unhappiness or mis misery that they, they die and sometimes their lives uh, 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 you know, get cut short by human beings. We don't get that. So he is somehow saying that we should be like flies. We don't seem to know that they are unhappy when it comes to their mom, yani moments of death. So uh, this is very philosophical, right? Yes. OK, type. let's look at the poem. Uh, let's let's focus on the form in terms of how long the lines is, whether they are long or short, uh, in terms of uh, rhyming and w which of the lines are rhyming together, whether the language is complex and complicated. Um, can we talk about that? I'll, I'll, I'll give you perhaps two more minutes to read it one more time and focus on the form and how the form helps us reach the conclusions that we have reached about the fragility of human beings and the vanity of human wishes and the fact that human beings are very insignificant in the grand scheme of things. Go ahead. You guys have three minutes.
Let me know when you have finished. I'm done, doctor. OK. OK, so uh, as I said, we're focusing on the formal aspects, the word formal from the word form, shakl. We're focusing on the horizontal aspects and the vertical aspects of the poem, whatever is internal, the internal music, the figures of speech and the imagery. Right? Yes. OK, OK, let's talk about it. So how, how do you, what do you think? Do you think that the poet was successful in communicating his thoughts through the form that he is using? Let's talk about the lines, whether they are long or short, whether this is significant or just random. Um, can we have, yeah, can we have somebody else and then come back to you? Okay. I need fresh voices. I need other people to contribute. And like I said, nothing is wrong. This is poetry and poetry is about, um, you know, different opinions and different, um, you know, contributions and intakes. Yalla, go ahead. Who's with us? Yes, me. Oh, okay, what's your name? Rufaida. Yes. Go ahead, yeah, Rufaida. Uh, I think it's short line. Okay. And uh, excuse me, what do you ask? I mean, I mean, tell me about the poem. You know, what what your impressions are about the poem? Um, I mean, the arrangement of the words, the stanzas. You, you started off by saying that it's uh, short. Um, I mean, the lines are short. Whatever yeah. comes soon. Yeah, I go ahead. When, when I read, I like like um, nursing, the baby the song. Okay, so I'm hopeful that you haven't read the chapter because we're trying. Like I said, you don't approach a poem by reading about it. So you don't you start you don't start by reading about the poem. You start by reading the poem itself. Yeah. I'm hopeful. Uh, so you 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 have uh, you mean you you had previous experience with poetry like this uh, yes yes okay and it reminds you of nursery uh, nursery rhymes yes <laughs> like okay okay that's interesting that's a very good conclusion any anything else here rufaida uh, no okay not for now okay yes. thank you so much you're welcome. you're welcome can we have somebody else everyone anyone yes doctor hello yes doctor Okay, go ahead. Mona <clears throat> okay, Mona, I think, go ahead. Uh, the, poem, the poem is uh, very simple, okay. yet uh, very informative in a way. Very, very what? Informative. Very informative. You know, yes. uh, informative, it gives in us information. Way. Okay, go in on. Information and uh, feelings without uh, putting too many words and too many complications. Uh, mm. he, he's using simplicity in his uh, poem. Okay. And that's why. Okay. What's your name? Mona Muhammad. Ali. Mona Muhammad. Muhammad or Muhammad? Muhammad. Muhammad. Ali. Muhammad. Right? Muhammad. Ali. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. Can we have somebody else? Yes, doctor. OK, go ahead. Uh, as my colleague said, the lines uh, are very short. Yeah, I, I noticed that most of the lines are made of four words. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if this has any significant meaning or not. Uh, it's very it's very easy on the it's ear. Actually, let, let me uh, stop you, uh, Fatma, and ask you. There Aya. are lines. Aya. No? My name is Aya. Ah, yeah, ah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I and uh, Fatma obviously have the same quality of voice. Uh, okay, Aya. Ah, yeah. uh, the lines are as short as what in life? 
as short as uh, what, what do you mean as short as what in life? I mean, li life itself is short. Don't you yeah, think exactly. life? Yes, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So the form, the form would reflect the idea. Mm. I mean, the whole, and we came to the conclusion that the poem is about how short life is, right? Yes. So it, it's the lines are expressing that, are confirming the shortness of life. The lines, I mean, so, so the style can reflect and can confirm the ideas. Yeah, this is what we're trying to say. So mm. through the lines, the, the lines, uh, he's making the lines short because his whole subject matter is about shortness. It uh, is about the brevity of human life, the vanity of human wishes, right? Yes. How, 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 how long do, do we live? 70, 80, 90, no. right? And then, so this is short. In the grand scheme of things, this is very short. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Aya. Thank you so much. Okay. Ataima, we kept you on hold for so long. Go ahead. Uh, yes, doctor. Go ahead. I think he didn't follow the grammatical. Um rules uh, in writing mm. they are short and um, it's kind of complicated to understand it uh, in uh, quickly mm -hmm. which is typical uh, of poetry at Aima, right yes. which is typical of poetry and also which is typical of philosophical poetry right? there is uh, the added dimension here is the idea of philosophy the fact that this poem is highly philosophical and philosophy is not easy, right? Yes. Oh, excellent. Go on. Uh, I think uh, he, uh, uh, in the third line in each uh, stanza, he didn't follow the same rhyme. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Do you think this is also meant, the yes. fact that he is not, I mean, if you compare him to other uh, poets, other poets are perhaps more organized, you know, but you don't have this uh, this uh, sharp contrast between the lines. Some lines are so long and not so long, yeah, you know, long, and others are short, right? Yeah, you meant so this, it, like that. Yeah, do, do you think that? Do you think that would also inform the theme that can also contribute to the idea that life is arbitrary? You know, arbitrary. Life is random. Yes. Right? So uh, yes. what I'm trying to establish here is the fact that the style, the form can help you understand, uh, 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 you know, the theme and the ideas in more ways than one. Yes, exactly. The form would reflect the ideas and the ideas would be more accessible if you uh, check the form, and if you un understand, uh, break down the form uh, and the style to its basic components. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think we 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 need um, uh, to perhaps meet tomorrow, if you don't mind, for for more on the same. Can we meet tomorrow so so that we can finish uh, this very interesting chapter? Yes, doctor, yes. Mm. Okay, so what time is convenient to you? As you like. It's up to you. Um, okay. Same time? Same time. Uh, as well. would, would, would we make it... Uh, uh, don't you think that uh, two uh, o'clock two would be difficult for you? Two, so I have a class. What kind of class? Uh, A238. Dr. Mahsin. A to 30 B. A to 30 A. Ah. A yeah. A to 30 A. Maybe right. at 12. Ah, oh, doctor. But uh, maybe he he will cancel it because usually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because what? Uh, by the way, I'm I'm the BCC. Tell me. <laughs> yes, because <laughs> he gave us on Tuesday. I don't think he will give us on Thursday either. 
طيب so we cannot leave it hanging um, like this. So two is fine by me. Okay. So can do it morning. Ma'am. Can do it in the morning. In the morning. Yes, I uh, Would you um, so would morning at the, you mean ten a.m. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, That's good. Yeah, would nine. that be convenient to everyone? Yes, morning is way better. About Hi. me. So, yes. So it's uh, we'll make it inshallah 10 a.m. tomorrow. So what I want you to do in the meantime, I would like you to skim through the different parts and be ready with the poems. So read the poems and don't read. I don't want you to read the critical material. I don't want you to read the chapter. I want you to read the poem itself. So you have three poems or uh, perhaps five or six. If you add uh, those by uh, what's his name? Uh, D.H. Lawrence. So I would like you to read and have your own conclusions about the poems. Try to connect the style to the theme and the ideas. Uh, and like I said, nothing is wrong when it comes to poetry. No absolute truth. Everything is acceptable as long as you can uh, provide justifications for what you're saying. OK. okay. So I'll, I'll see you. To, yeah, yes, go ahead. Uh, how, ma uh, uh, how many classes do we have left or? Uh, we'll have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, tomorrow and inshallah next week, some uh, will will have to finish somehow. So next week we will have Wednesday and uh, um, if we can't finish on Wednesday, we can have Thursday also. So you will have next week one or two classes, inshallah. And how many chapters in the final? Uh, I don't know about that. I, I need to ask in the BCC. Um, Thank you, Doctor. I'll, I'll check and get back to you. Doctor, how many chapters are included as in the next uh, quiz? Um, because I check uh, LMS now. Mm. Uh, wrote just uh, chapter two. Um, I don't know yet. Uh, perhaps we'll have something on poetry, the chapter that we're doing. I think it's a, it's the chapter that we're doing right now. Yeah. No. yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Inshallah, I'll, I'll uh, talk to Miss Fatma and see what she has to say. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yalla, gama, on this uh, note and with this item, we'll come to the end of today's class. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doctor. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. You're welcome.